गुड मॉर्निंग रोहन set up related settings for rf uh, i've also shared the rf book and like a pdf document from city you know which explains how to add notes in your monitor so it's just it's there to your books folder so today we will continue and complete our remaining um, reporting transactions so once uh, one such reporting transaction which i want to discuss for the is a uh, easy graphical framework it's kind of a reporting or a kpi based uh, tracking of uh, yeah various uh, activities which are going on in the wells so you can see you know this is a uh, graphical views so these are the uh, these are the some of the you know way of showing different information particularly this is used for your manager you know they want to track how many uh, resources are working and you know uh, how many bins have been counted or how many resources were planned how many are working actual so all kind of information you want to see in graphical format so easy to move is a tool which they can use okay. so this is the graphical way of representing you can also uh, represent data in a Uh, text form here. Uh, so this data can be, you know, uh, refreshed in every let's say 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. So we put a refresh rate, we put a graph type, we we choose what information we want to display, and then you know you can show it on your easy graphical framework tool. So. I'll just show you the easy graphical framework. Some of the standard uh, standard KPIs which are already in place. You can have a quick look on. The transaction for easy graphical framework is slash n slash c w e g f easy graphical framework. Okay, and then you have to create basically one e g f implementation. S A P has provided us one demo cockpit. Okay, where you will see some of the graphs. You know, let's say, for example, a door assignment. so you can see this graph and then you know you can double click and it will show you some more detailed data of the graph let's say these are the doors door 1 these are the shipments that are being handled at door 1 then if you double click you can design another graph which shows you you know what was the planned duration what was the actual duration for the doors being occupied okay then you can change your graph type here and then you can also change your refresh rate here and you can skip the second okay so you can then display four or you can you know change the grid make it just one just change the grid and make it one by one so it will become a big graph so four or you can six or eight you can display any number of you know um charts here so you can open and close this menu and you can display this entire in your as if it's on your on the television screen you know big screen in your warehouse so that or it can be kept running in a in, in your uh, small screen in your in the room of your manager or supervisor who keeps a track you can define different thresholds you know saying that if the value is above 6 
about let's say 50 so below 50 so or above 50 whatever the color changes or it becomes bold or something like that you can put that as well so uh, this uh, this is just one you know you can you can see some more cockpits and uh, uh, these are all demos so you know we have to do some you know coding for us to be able to achieve uh, this kind of graph so you can see some of the standard ones which are there these are for MFS these are for your you know how many waves are overdue how many warehouse orders are overdue then you can say from how many how much time they are overdue overdue so how many how much time has gone past you know until which this task have not been confirmed so it gives us let's say one is a task it gives us a linear figure here but if you want multiple data and uh, you know, sing, single information can be easily fetched, but if you want more and more data and more complex graph with uh, multiple information, then we have to do some coding behind it. Okay, so I'll just take you through uh, the node where you can do those things. Again, I will share you with the uh, document for this as well how you can, uh, I mean the best practice for the easy graphical framework implementation. So, uh, monitoring, easy graphical framework, you know, you can define, you know, you can define chart types. I mean, uh, you can also upload, you know, if you, a different chart formats, okay, so there is a transaction given by SAP for uploading a, um, Different different charts here. Uh, I think you can see this. Yeah, you can see there are pop code. You can see. Uh, the copy. This is the EGF transaction, and these are the templates that you can, you know, upload. So, if you want a specific color combination, you can download existing template, change some colors, and upload those template and use them. Okay, so import template, export templates, all those options are there. So you can explore them if you want any specific color combination as such. So, um, if we go to the cockpit. So these are you know the different um, uh, let's say the warehouse profit. So these are the different parameter. Let's say the selection is based on warehouse number. Okay. And then these are the objects. So you can see there are many objects here. So creating folder, moving around the objects is very easy. Hiding and hiding is you know, all everything is possible from here. You right click and you can create or you can you can just create folder and remove objects or something like that. You can do you can enter your chart type. The default chart types comes from here. So this is your object. Uh, this is your um, uh, when you are creating. This is the main thing which governs all your uh, you know display of data. So you have to do some coding here so, so that you can from where to fetch the data okay from where to how to display everything you can control using this so where this number is a input and table shoot and table so you know if you want to double click and so that it should display something then I think you can also have functions here so yeah all these configurations are you know well explained in that okay I'll share with you so to create objects so this is the main thing which we need to work at and you know we need to get this object there are some standard objects but we will have to create our own objects and you know make some changes and you can say that uh, 
one such example would be you know in labor management if you want to show a graph saying that how many resources are doing each activity so you will enter activity picking packing staging loading put away and you can track how many resources are doing each activity so you know from from uh, your, uh, you can also refer to you know, the functional modules which are being used in your monitor to get you those information. So this is not this is not a detailed analytic, analytical tool, you know, where you can double click. Suppose the quantity here is hundred, you cannot just double click and display all those hundred. So if you want to display in detail, then the exact list of orders or exact list of uh, resources, then you have to go in the monitor and put your selection and then display that information accordingly. So yeah, this is one tool which is there in EWM. Um, so there is another way of you know doing analytics. You know you can uh, EWM integrates with VW, and you can send all your information through uh, the standard extractors and to EWM and uh, from EWM to VW, and you can uh, use that information in uh, VW for your reporting like you have with your other ECC modules. Okay. So, yeah, that integration with VW is also there. Let's go to our, you know, next monitoring uh, possibility that we have in AWM. The next one is your we did easy graphical framework. So next one is a graphical warehouse layout. Okay. So a warehouse layout if you uh, I mean I gave you I showed you video, I showed you high level warehouses how they look like. But if you want, if you are going in a detailed implementation where you are putting exact coordinates for your bins and you are you know tracking each and every uh, coordinates where they are and resources you know like say you want you are calculating how much time it will take what is the distance and you know all those things if, if the warehouse is a very very detailed level implementation then it is this uh, layout what it does it gives a graphical representation so you can enter your warehouse and it gives you a graphical representation you know based on your coordinates it generates this you know a uh, view of your warehouse. Okay, so let's say this is uh, that this is some area. This is some racking storage. You, know, you can give coordinates of walls. You can give coordinates of you know any pillars or something that are there in between. You can you know put coordinates of bins. You can put uh, coordinates of offices. So. All this information can be stored in your coordinates of your conveying systems. Okay, so um, it gives you a graphical representation of your warehouse. You can uh, use it for your uh, resource information where they are and what what work is going on. So it gives you visualization of your warehouse. Okay, and. Uh, Basically, the efforts involved in getting this created is too much. You, know, you have to put all the coordinates and you have to make sure they are correct. So only when you are, you know, implementing for a warehouse it becomes uh, practically possible then, and only then, you know, when they uh, give you the exact coordinates and you are putting them in system, that time it is possible to, you know, see the actual field. So, um, uh, so things like your yard, you know, like which how many trucks, trailers, you can have different color codings. So you can see basically when the truck comes in the yard, you put it in a some bin or you put it in a door and all those things. They, you can all see them here, you know, by giving some color code to your truck or trailer. So this is a door. So if the truck has come here, so the color will change. So basically it just takes the information from the bin and accordingly displays here, which is you know, very useful if you are doing a graphical. 
you can double click and within the storage tab you can just see all your bins you know how your bins are arranged in your racking and double click and info uh, get information at bin level also here you have here you can display resources if you click this so as I said you know you can just double click get coordinates of the bins so the bins are also displayed you know exactly over here so yeah you can just click the bin So I mean when we work with uh, the face with conveyors, so you can also you know if it is not moving, so not moving means you know the product is not changing positions from one bit to another. So you can track that that there is an issue with the conveyors. So I mean all these things we can you know depending on our company where we are implementing these uh, uh, layouts, we can. Mm. Put those information. So now, you know, basically, uh, I'll just show you a layout which I've just prepared for another warehouse. You know, as I said, the time taken to prepare all these things is too much. Just prepared a rough layout, you know, for uh, one of uh, the warehouses. Now, I think this is also not good. So I'll just take another warehouse where I can do a little GR. take um, standard SAP warehouse so we can see you know, if they have configured or no. mm -hmm. I had put some bins also here, just trying to see if I can see them. Mm -hmm. No, I think I don't have any bit of information maybe. So you know these are all the elements you know which have come. These are offices. These are kind of pillars. These are the walls. So all this information is coming from your config. So the permanent uh, uh, objects in your warehouse, you can create them here. Okay. So. Let's see for our warehouse WHO one. So you can see offices, walls, floor, ground. Okay, so all this information it comes from here. See this is the coordinates which I have just entered here, which you know displays them for here. So yeah, you can try changing different coordinates to see, you know, or uh, this existing one. If you want, you can, you know, design our own warehouse layout. Okay. So, um, yeah, but the time take it really takes a lot of time in you know, setting this up. So, if at all any of your customer needs it, you can uh, propose this, and if for for your practice as well, if you want, you can create some bins, give XYZ coordinates and you know like this and it will display here accordingly. So this is again one more monitoring transaction that we have or tracking transaction in the warehouse. Then yeah, these are the few ones as I told you the mostly used one. 99% uh, of the time the one which will be used will be uh, the monitor. Which is, which is really really important and is, uh, it's kind of a single report in transaction so any new reports are going to create you're going to create it here okay. then I think we are 
I was done with the reporting. So last thing, uh, just wanted to explain you on the RFIDs. Though it's it's not part of our V2 um, list of topics, but still I just wanted to give you a brief introduction of an RFID. If time permits, we'll we'll also see in the subsequent sessions on um, on phase or how things are done in RFID. The idea here is to give you an introduction on RFID and how they are used, or and they are not that much used in. SAP or you know, manufacturing industries, but yeah, we see them as a future. So since we have been talking about RF, just thought of you know uh, giving you a brief idea about RFIDs, which we consider as you know future maybe five years, ten years down the line. So RFIDs, uh, as you all might have you know come across RFIDs into your day-to-day -day, uh, lives. So RFID is nothing but you know, it is a chip which we and there is a reader. So this is a chip which is which we insert in the product. Okay, and once you move the product, so if there is a receiver here. So chip moves, the information is sent to the receiver. So you don't need to scan anything on the RF. So automatically, when the chip moves, the information is read, read product quantity, all those things, and in the background, you know, this receiver takes that information and it does activity in the background like posting a good receipt, or confirmation of task or anything. So no need of you know scanning anything. No manual intervention here. So uh, we have a similar examples. Uh, let's say your car keys gets opened you know at a distance of 10 meters that is nothing but your RF. Uh, you can see such RF IDs, RF ID chips in your uh, uh, in your retail stores, you know, if you are buying something and you know it has a chip, if you try to take it out without paying, you know, you will see that alarm starts blinking. So that is nothing but your RFID. Okay, so RFID has a lot of use. Plus there are some disadvantages also. So uh, the disadvantages that we see, the challenges we can see as of now is the prices. So the prices are too high. So um, on the other side, you know, you see, even though the prices are high, they can be reused. Okay, so you take a chip when the product goes out, you can re-enter data into the chip or some other part and then reuse it. Okay, then um, it can really store a lot of information, not only product quantity. See, in a one barcode, there are two D barcodes where it can store two information like a product and a serial number or a product and quantity uh, so one barcode can store two details or maximum three details but here in RFID you can store n number of details for your product okay. so you can store um, um, your quantity your and entire you know label you don't have to scan different barcodes everything will be stored in just one chip so that information can be stored so RFIDs can be used in harsh environments and again you know the possible challenge with respect to working in harsh environments is like uh, it cannot be used in certain certain metal liquids or you know certain special type of items okay then there are some you know health concerns or uh, privacy legal -like concerns as well because you are exposed to some radiations over here, even though they are very light. But you know, uh, if uh, you use a lot of RFIDs, you see a lot of radiations here, so signaling here. So maybe you know there could be some health concerns as well. Okay, so so you can have you know anti-collision algorithms. A lot of algorithms can be written to fetch you know whatever information you need so you can write write in whatever logic you want for fetching that information let's say there's a lot of information in the chip so you say if the chip if the information has let's say for example uh, there is there is a product number you say if the any line item which starts with P consider that as product number okay if any line item starts with Q 
uh, consider that as a quantity okay and same way you can add whatever information you need okay. then as you we can see at a very basic level is that we need not to you know labels we need to stick those labels and they need to be visible so that we can scan them so generally what will happen is you know when you put labels on palettes you have to put labels here on the back side on the left side on the right side because if any side gets blocked during the placement the other side is available for you to scan the labels so again you know this this kind of uh, issues will not face so it's basically a you have a tag you have a receiver and then that communicates with the CP and you can you know carry out actions in the system and then a very typical uh, process with RFID you know, with EWM I can just give you a very uh, very basic process example with uh, for some customers they can do this way so the supply chain if it works full fetched and you have RFIDs, so the possible flow between your, your customer and your vendor, uh, so between you and your vendor or between your, you and your customer could be like this. Okay, so the vendor, you know, builds the product, packs the product. So while building, you know, and packing, it prints the tag RFID tags. Okay, and that tag. You know, is uh, that information, RFID information, product handling unit, all that information is sent to your vendors. So it's uh, sent by a vendor to the customer. Let's say we are the customer. So say they send all this information to us. Okay, and then let's say the initial process starts with we send the purchase order to the vendor. Then vendor communicates uh, saying that yes, we have received the purchase order, and once the product is ready. They print the tag and then they, you know, they send that information. This is the product we are shipping, and this handling unit, and this is the quantity of each handling unit. Uh, and each handling unit has this much boxes and so on. Okay. Then as soon as they move this out, so food issue takes place in the background. The vehicle comes in, and as soon as you take this handling unit in, since you have all the handling unit information in advance by ASN so automatically when it comes in the information is read and SAP recognizes it because you have received the handling unit information you are expecting those uh, 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 pallets okay so let's say it's nothing but you know we create inborn delivery so inborn delivery then we do GR of those handling units so inborn delivery with handling unit is created so that handling unit is ready and once we move the stock system recognizes those handling units because they are in system in some ASN and a good receipt takes place in the background and then you know, subsequently you can do a put away or picking whatever. So it is good you know in terms of uh, it tracks physically that stock goes out or stock comes in but you know there are some restrictions also you know like I mean for this single level execution it is very good let's say good issue would receive but let's say you want to move it from one bin to another and automatically that you know should be read and carried out so you can imagine you know every bin should have some receiver you know to read what stock it has so yeah that's a brief uh, background on RFIDs so uh, not much use now. EWM has a standard integration, or EWM has a RFID uh, integration to uh, not to ID infrastructure, and uh, it's there in the standard out of the box uh, solution that we have in EWM that was not there in WM or it was missing. So we have some standard uh, things available in RFIDs and. Yeah, I said you, you know markets as a, as a possible feature, but I don't see uh, uh, much companies using it, you know, because of uh, some of the challenges that we saw. I mean, cost is the main challenge of this. You know. Tables are easy to print, reprint, and get lost, torn off, can be reprinted. But yeah, 
there is, uh, I can imagine our warehouses, they are not as small as, you know, a retail store, they are very, very big. They have lots and lots of parts there, so, let's say, millions of parts cannot be stored at any point of time in some bigger warehouses. So, this is, this becomes really, you know, not feasible in many cases. But yeah, uh, definitely, you know, if in future we might see some more optimized RFID tags and more optimized uh, uh, RFID process. So, we might see them, you know, being used. So, so here I think we just complete our uh, uh, week two course where we just covered uh, mostly the master data and with master data we just covered some monitoring and RF related settings. Okay. So I mean the idea with, with week two was we covered all the small bits and pieces which come you know, when we execute our processes. So week three we start executing the different different processes, inbound, outbound, and then you know these these are kind of um, uh, things we use for executing the process like RI along with master data. So any questions on whatever we discussed today or anything related to any topic in week two? It's not necessary if you can ask me later also, that's also fine. Then, um, I would like to, before we go ahead into week 3, as you can see, the week 3 is entirely, you know, good receiving process, okay, where we first understand good receiving, I think we have already done a very basic good receiving process where we get to good receipt put away, but still we do a lot of stuff related to good receiving, we still revise and we tap create some duties to the receiving, then we will see all the documents that are there in the good receipt part, different possibilities of good receipt, what storage control is, what expected good receipt, so all this is related to receiving, you know. So not only receiving from your vendor, but also receiving from your production. What slotting and rearrangement is, what is a good receipt pro process overview when you complex it with things like slotting and expected good receipt. Availability group we have already seen, it's, it's part of, um, you know, the uh, initial integration that we did, we created availability group, there is the one and two, so this part we have already covered. So most important is our strategies. So we have just seen good receipt and then manually push the stock into different different storage types. Now we are going to see the strategy, you know, how system will determine where a particular stock should go, from where a particular stock should be removed. You know, those kind of strategies we set in Dublin or anywhere other system. So automatically when you do GR, system determines the pin where it should go. So that pin we have a lot of configuration and strategies. So, what are the standard strategies in AWM? We will go through them. So, how will AWM determine based on your product or based on your process or based on your um, uh, movement that you have been carrying, carrying out? So, it determines you know, where you, the stock should be taken. So, whether it should be taken to 8001, 2, 3, 4, 5, or it should be taken to a decant area or a quality area or a staging area, wherever. So all this information, you know, or all these strategies we'll set up in the system. So before we start um, three, just wanted to update you on how we are going to you know, execute our processes. So coming back to our uh, data that we have been setting for our demo. So we have created Hi, Prashant. Uh, no, no, actually, Shreyas pinged me, so I was replying to him. 
Okay. So just a continuation of you know preparing test data, you know, we, we have created our op structure initially and then we decided on the products, we decided on the packing requirement for the products, we created some vendors, some customers. We, we, we create you know these are the information for you know for you to create some packing material or materials. So then I mean this sheet I've just kept it because to clear up confusion on the packaging material. So then I would like to explain to you you know how our warehouse layout is. So for our warehouse you know I've prepared a small layout for you so that we can design the strategies accordingly. So these are all the products that we are making. Okay. So these are the doors from where we will receive the stock. These are the doors you know, from where the stock goes out. So I am just taking a very typical basic you know, warehouse where we are going to uh, just for the ease of understanding what we are doing in the system and how it is physically related I have just drawn a layout for us. So this is the good receipt, this is the good issue area. So good receipt there are two kinds of uh, areas for receiving. This is for your um, some parts which you receive in your general survey, this is for parts which you, you know, so these parts are, okay, which are stored in general, these parts which are stored in these three storage types. So, basically, you know, what I have done is, you can see, these are the doors, and this is the staging area, this is the inbound staging area, this is the outbound staging area. So, when you get go to seed, you put it in the GR zone, and you put it in the bin. So, this is your staging area. And before, so the green color ones are the ones where you actually store the product. Okay, so this is your staging area, so you in a different color. These are your work centers, you know, packing work centers. You might do deconsolidation, you might do quality. So you have to give a different color for work centers, so different colors for doors, different for staging areas. These green ones are the actual storage. So these are standard storage type for your quality, for your deconsolidation. So once we receive the stock in GR zone at some position, you know, we might have to take it to quality, then from quality to decon or decon to quality and then put it in the warehouse. So, you know, there are different, different places for storage. I have identified, you know, we had five storage type, 801, 2, 3, 4, and 5, yeah. So I think we had six. So I just kept pump storage either four or six so we'll see the storage of pump which is a finished product uh, first in a storage step as pallets pallet strategy and then a bulk strategy so we'll use either of them okay so just to test strategies we first use it as uh, 8004 considering 8004 is a pump storage or uh, when we use bulk strategy we'll see 8006 as a uh, as a finished goods store. Okay, so then we have a production line here. So the moment if you see, you know, when we receive products from vendors, we put it here, and then from here we put it into, we move it across this different work center. Then we either put it into this storage type, or this storage type, or this storage type, or this storage type, or this storage type, depending on the type of products we are storing, and this is a, this is the, the place. This is the hall where the assembly is going on or the production is going on. So you supply your pump uh, parts like your casing, your flywheel, your shafts to this production supply uh, storage type. And when the product is ready, we receive it from here into here, okay, into your finished goods stores. The pumps they are lying over here, and then you pick them from here, you pack them. Then you stage them here, and then you do the good issue. This is, you know, this is for your outbound. Okay. So, just based on, you know, the product characteristics, I have just designed some uh, storage type for them. Let's say finished products will be always do an Casings, you know, this is a storage type which has a lot of space, you know, to store. So the bulky parts, you know, the casing. And you know there are 
casing for your uh, flywheel, casing for your you know, sharp. So casing, you know, there are two, three parts in the casing. So all the casings are, will be stored in 8003. You, your slugs, you know, which are again small parts, you get it in handling units, gaskets, you are going to store it here, 8001. There are screws and bolts, you know, which are loose pallet, loose pieces. You know, we have just said in our ox structure that for bolts there is no handling on it. Nuts and bolts are we get them loose. So just put them into a storage step 8005. Okay. Then again casings coming into three flywheels 8002. So yeah. So the, all the flywheels and uh, the electronic drive at 8002. All the casings in 8003. So all the uh, spare parts or small small equipment, small small parts, nuts, bolts, washers, everything will be coming here. Okay. And then 8000, all the slugs basically, you know, the uh, the parts which you receive with handling unit. But you know, you, let's say we receive uh, and these slugs are small parts. Okay. We we just saw the slugs. They are small parts. They fix on a shaft or in a flywheel. But we get them in big handling units. So let's say we have a handling unit of thousand, but for each pump we need only two slugs, right? So we put all the handling units here, and you know we do replenishment from this storage type to this storage type. So and we pick from this storage type. So I mean parts which are small, but we receive a bulk, huge quantity like slugs. We'll put them here in the high rack storage. <clears throat> the bulk, the parts like you know gasket, sorry, the parts like um, uh, what do we say uh, shafts, you know, which let's say I receive ten shafts, my production require ten shafts in one HU, production requires ten shafts because at any point ten uh, pumps are being built, so I don't have big pallet sizes, small pallet sizes, so I keep them in this racking storage. So same way, um, some more example for racking storage is a flywheel. So flywheel, you know, maybe it's a big in size, so I can have a one pallet for one flywheel. Flywheels are delicate, you know, they have serrations, we don't want to damage them. So we generally put it in one pallet so that they don't get, uh, you know, damaged by, uh, by you know, or we don't get that dirt and other things on the flywheel because um, because of the exposure, so we'll keep the flywheel in one pallet, and that pallet, you know, we'll store it here, and then from here we can supply it to line. Engine storage, all the bulky big parts, rack storage for like casings, rack storage for parts which are uh, handled in small quantities in handling units. H001 parts which are in handling unit but bigger quantity. And the requirement on the line is smaller than the pallet sizes. Fixed storage generally the parts which we don't have handling units. The loose parts, the spare parts, small small parts we are going to use here. There is one process called as uh, uh, replenishment. So we use the combination of these two for replenishment. So when we go into that particular scenario, I'll just explain you how you can move out why we need replenishment and how we, we are going to set up. So this is very high level. So what we are going to do for our products which are now available, the pack specs is also there. So we we'll just make we'll make sure that when I do a good receipt of the casings, it comes into this. I do receive of its gasket, it goes into this. Okay, and then once we determine the storage time, when the, once I do the good receipt of the pump, it should come here. So once we receive the parts you know how the movements are being carried out after, I mean how the bins are being determined that is the main um, configuration in the code machine then we can design the flow like some parts we just want to receive from go receive into directly to warehouse some parts you want to put them to quality some parts you want to put them to deconsolidation and so on yeah some parts we we might need to you know not take Get to any of this, we will directly put them uh, from door into warehouse into the storage type 
we don't put it into staging we put it from door and directly put it into the, the actual storage so here I'll just give you the visualization of a, a typical warehouse when you go for working for a company you know you might have similar or you know different kind of uh, uh, structure depending on the company's product and their way of operations but yeah typically look for the warehouse layout the first time you go into any warehouse that will design the most of your uh, you know movements and flows and uh, your uh, designing of your warehouse in so your system design everything will be based on your layout because as you know in EWM is kind of a it's a physical execution of uh, how things are going on you know practically how movements have been going on within the warehouse so that movements are basically replicated in EWM so we need to know exactly how the layout is how the movements are going to be carried out so this layout, layout you can also create it you know in your easy graphical frameworks time take it takes really really a lot of time or else I would have tried to create this one so we will not go that way so is it clear on how we are going to approach our V3 uh, so it's all inbound all movements into this we will ensure that um, by week 3 we have all stocks available for all the parts here okay so in week 4 maybe we'll do supply to line uh, and in week 5 we can maybe do good issues to customer okay so receive for production and then go to customer so we can see end to end flow you know for our warehouse so any questions regarding the layout or what approach you are following is it clear If no questions, then we go ahead. Um, I think we have just 10 minutes left. We will just try to uh, recap, you know, uh, possible good receipt that we have done. You know, recap of uh, a good receipt that we had carried out for our testing of uh, integration so during testing of integration and during you know um, the uh, RF you know testing we had created you know some inbound deliveries based on purchase order that inbound DVDs are also called ASN in the ECC system. Okay, and in EWM creates a inbound delivery notification and inbound delivery. Based on that inbound delivery, we create warehouse tasks. Okay, so this inbound delivery we created manually using the L31N. We can also get it from vendors via EDI. So we, I've also already told you, you know, we we have uh, EDI setup and there is the message style DES ADV, based on which you know we get all the uh, the information. Like we also saw in RFID, now we get all the information from vendors in a in an IDOC form, which when they ship the parts, that creates a uh, ASN automatically in ECC. Okay, so when that once that ASN is created automatically, it automatically moves to. Uh, EWM because the storage location is EWM managed. Then you know we can uh, just get a lot of deliveries. So we can take any delivery and we can do some good receipt. But before we do, you know, the two documents that we have inbound is inbound delivery notification, inbound delivery. So 
before we go ahead, just a recap again, you know, what notification is and what input delivery is. So once we receive the delivery from ECC, it's a notification in EWM. That notification is nothing but you know, a replication of the delivery. Okay. That notification is nothing but a replication of the delivery from ECC into EWM. So let's say we see this notification. So when we receive from the delivery from ECC to EWM, you know, first what it does it, or what copies all the relevant details. Okay, it copies all the relevant details from ECC delivery into EWM. Okay, all wherever relevant details from the delivery. So the delivery has a lot of information in ECC. So all, not all information is relevant to warehouse. So when it gets distributed, it passes on all this information. This is all the information which we need in warehouse. So here you can see, you know, quantity, weight, tolerances, and you know, stock types, vendors. So you can see that the inbound delivery notification number is the same as your delivery number in ECC. Okay, so this gets automatically converted into inbound delivery. So what happens is so there is a standard uh, PPF. PPF is nothing but a kind of your automated condition record you can imagine for time being. So this PPF is like your condition get triggered and your condition records get satisfied and your condition uh, so your, your action is processed. The action is to create inbound delivery. So this happens automatically. So everything goes well, you will directly have inbound delivery in this transaction, in the, this part. So same PRDI, you can see notification, you can see inbound delivery. We will not carry out any activity for your notification except you might do reject. So reject means, you know, if something, if your notification is created, but for some reason you want delivery couldn't be created, so you can reject it. Okay. So let's say at this point, you know, let's say the handling and number range, there is some issue or there is some issue in the product, that product is not maintained in EWM and we get, got a, AS, uh, a notification from ECC. So we can reject, you know, if the product number is wrong or we can, you know, kind of, if it is an error, we can activate it once we have maintained the product in EWM. Okay. Then, uh, notification apart from these two things, you will not be doing anything. Detecting and activating if there is something error. So this notification is automatically converted into inbound delivery for which we do receive, we do put away. Okay. So if you notice, you know, um, inbound delivery notifications like your purchase requisition or you know it's like your uh, transfer requirement. So first, what what it does is it simply copies information or it, it keeps a it's a planning document. And whereas, 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 but delivery is your actual execution document. So once your delivery is replicated to EWM, so your master data and all the configuration of EWM are not yet read when the notification is created. But why it is converting it into inbound delivery? It reads all the master data information. It reads all the configuration on the EWM. Okay. And this is a delivery which is, you know, uh, EWM delivery. We have a number which is uh, generated from EWM. You can also see the reference important with number here. Okay. So this delivery it considers all the config and you know all the master data setup that we have in EWM. So until inbound delivery is created, you know, and while it is converting from here to here, it needs all the one phase master data all set up that you have done in EWM and you will see things like what is the movement time, what is the bin, so what is the owner, what into the dispose, all these things are being fetched you know, while this conversion takes place. So you can get the door information, PSA, a lot of information. Okay. Some of this information, you know, gets copied from the ECC delivery into notification, from notification into inbound delivery as well. Okay, so this is yeah, you know, typical uh, delivery. We can do a lot of actions. You know, let's say I don't want this, 
so I can I have just created the mistake so I can reject it so rejection will make the quantity zero here and which in turn will go and update ECC so automatically a queue will be sent to ECC to make the quantity zero in ECC okay. so you know after once the delivery is created in EWM you know you cannot do any changes on the ECC side any changes deletion or cancellation of a delivery changing of quantity splitting of delivery any action which has to be carried out has to be carried out from EWM system okay. so once the delivery is distributed once the delivery is sent to EWM this is quantity is zero now so once the delivery is distributed you cannot do anything in the e in the ECC side so EWM becomes your primary system for execution okay so let's say this delivery was created wrongly or some data was missing or uh, quantity was wrong so any correction required has to be done from EWM or if you want to recreate it cancellation also from EWM like you have rejected this okay. so this and we, we can do good receipt here. We have also done good receipt on the RF transaction. Yeah. And then after good receipt, we go here and we did a manual way of creating a task. We create the task and confirm the task. Okay. Same way you can do some unloading. You can do return to vendor if in case you want to you know, set the product of the receipt or send it back to the vendor so you can show your returns from here. Okay. So these are you know some uh, possible uh, topics on the uh, delivery screen. So so what all kind of inbound deliveries are supported by EWM? We have deliveries which we come which comes from supplier. We have deliveries which come from uh, the, the stock. Sorry, the receipts where we receive them from production. We have receipts when we get something back from a customer or any ship from or any other plant where we have sent the product. So we also receive, you know, there is a special topic in inbound which I'm going to take. It's called as expected good receipt. So now what we could see is, you know, we are creating delivery in ECC and that delivery is moved to EWM and we do GR in EWM. So let's say for example, you know, inbound delivery by mistake, vendor has not sent us the ASM and product comes or uh, the parts are received in the EWM, parts mm -hmm. are received at the warehouse. So vendor has not sent us the inbound delivery, parts are ready. So now ideally what should be done? You know, uh, the, uh, the people in warehouse, they will call their guys in the office mm -hmm. that, hey, um, your, the parts have come, but I don't see any inbound delivery. Can you please create an inbound delivery for me? So the logistic planner will then call another, will call the vendor, hey, why haven't you sent me the inbound delivery? They will say, oh, we sent it, but it got failed somewhere. So, you know, it takes a lot of time in sorting things out. Okay, then, you know, this was reported morning, somebody was not there, people were waiting, and then ultimately the delivery was created in evening. So, and fast moving warehouses, you don't need, you know, such you don't need such things, you know, you don't need uh, to wait. So you can imagine a, a, a pallet or, or let's say hundreds of pallets are there in the consignment. They are all occupying the place because you don't know whether you have to receive them or you don't have to receive them, you're waiting for decision. So what we need of them to do is, you know, once we get the products, if the, de if the delivery is not there, we can create the delivery in AWM, receive it, send it to warehouse, send it for placement. So so you can, you know, while creating the delivery system, we'll see yeah, whether it's correct for a purchase order, the purchase order was there, the quantity was there. So you can create the delivery yourself in EWM or, you know, uh, people from EWM can create the deliveries for them by themselves. Now this delivery which warehouse people will be creating will not be in ECC, it will be in EWM. So you can create delivery for a purchase order in EWM. So the idea is, you know, the warehouse guys, they don't have access to ECC system, so they, they can't go in VL31 and so the purchase order details are available in EWM where they go and create a delivery. So that, that is a special scenario, we'll see it in more details in next week's sessions, okay. So inbound delivery, 
uh, you know, not only comprises of good receipt, as I told you, there are many other steps, like you can do unloading, quality inspection, deconsolidation, kind of repacking, if you receive a pallet, you take it to a packing center and then you, you know, separate all your parts, do repacking and then send it for put away. You can take it for labeling, you can do it for cleaning or you can do it put it into a special pallet before casing. Anything more to do, you know, you can carry out. And the last step in inbound process is always put away. So you take your stock across different different storage types, but finally your inbound will be completed once you place the stock in your handle bin. Okay. So this is a basic inbound, you know, uh, which we have seen so far. Okay. We will be starting from slide three. So. Monday we'll meet again and we'll continue from where we have stopped. So and kind of week three is entirely inbound for so next week we we'll only talk about inbound. Okay. So I think that's all from me today. We'll stop here. If you have questions you can wait or else we'll end the session. Thanks for have a great weekend. Thank you. you too, sir. Thanks. Okay, looks like no questions, so we'll end the session. And if you have any queries, you can email me over the weekend. See you on Monday. Bye.